Act of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Welcome to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Thank you for joining me today and continuing on this journey with me through the book of Psalms, my favorite book of the Bible. I think it is my favorite book because of um, its closeness to Christian worship and prayer, Uh, specifically prayer, probably more than Christian worship, because truly worship is prayer and prayer is worship. And so if you want a model for how to pray and how to worship, uh, look at the book of Psalms. And so we are here today in Psalm 87. We are uh, almost to the conclusion of this third book in the Psalter. Remember, there are five books. Uh, There are three more chapters, 87, 88, and 89. And you will see three different attributions to its authorship. Uh, This one today, Psalm 87, is attributed to the sons of Korah. Now, we've seen psalms attributed to the sons of Korah before. Uh, Psalm 88, uh, also attributed to the sons of Korah. Um, But also mentioned in Psalm 88 is uh, Haman, the Ezraite. Uh, And then also in Psalm 89, Ethan, the Ezraite. So we see several names here, and then we will move on in Psalm 90 to book 4. So, Psalm 87, I've really enjoyed this psalm uh, because of its references to geographic locations. The object of this psalm is to glorify Jerusalem, or Zion. That is the seat of God's presence, as I've often mentioned, and we have seen several times in the book of Psalms, the mention of Jerusalem, the mention of Zion, almost in a louding or praising way. Uh, The city of Jerusalem is praised and honored. And so the unique contribution of Psalm 87 is really to give a glimpse of the universal character of God and his worship. And so it's universalistic, I guess that's a word, universalistic language brings to mind the future day when the Gentiles will be fellow heirs in the gospel. Ephesians 3, 6 says this, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And so those who are believers in Jesus Christ, even though we are not Jewish by heritage or even by uh, by our faith, we are Christian, we are grafted in to the body that was chosen by God. Uh, we've often heard that Israel, the Jewish people, that is God's chosen chosen people, uh, going back to Abraham. And um, But through Jesus Christ, the ultimate atoning sacrifice, we now have been grafted into that body. And so you will hear some universalistic language in Psalm 87. It's a short psalm, but very rich. Uh, rich to geographic references, but a reminder that God's worship is universal and includes every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Let me read for you Psalm 87. It begins with a title, the Psalm of the Sons of Korah. It is a song, obviously, as many of the psalms were. uh, This was written and composed for musical purposes. So let me read for you Psalm 87. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. And of Zion it shall be said, This one and that one were born in her. For the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord records as he registers the peoples. This one was born there. Singers and dancers alike say, All my springs are in you. So we see this 
joyous praise of the city of Jerusalem, the city of Zion. And it begins here in the first verse, on the holy mount stands the city he founded. So God is omnipresent, okay? Um, uh, people forget that sometimes. Often one of the most misquoted scriptures is in Matthew 18, it says, uh, where two or more are gathered, God is there. And it's often used out of context because the context of Matthew 18 is church discipline. It is not just general Christian worship. If you're going to use it for that, well, God is everywhere anyway. Any, he is everywhere. So he is, you know, in the most unholy places on earth even. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. That is something that Satan, the devil himself, cannot say. He is not everywhere. We often think of evil or Satan himself as the equal opposite of God, and he is not. Satan is not omnipresent. God is. He is everywhere. But he met his people in an intimate and special way at Zion, in the city of Jerusalem. And we see that throughout the book of Psalms. But it says in this first verse, on the holy mount stands the city he founded. This refers to the building of the temple on Mount Zion, north of the city of David, and towering over it. Verse 2, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. The point is not that God hated other parts of Israel but that he blessed Jerusalem with his presence. After the temple was built, there was only one designated place for the official worship of God, and that was at Jerusalem. You can see that in Deuteronomy 12. Verse 3, Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. This refers to the divine pronouncement to follow that comes in these next few verses. In verse 4, we get into some interesting things here. Among those who know me. So what is this verse talking about? Among those who know me. And then the psalmist mentions several places, but what is he talking about among those who know me? So there were occasional foreigners like Rahab and Naaman who worshipped the Lord during the Old Testament period. Uh, Exodus 12.38 a mixed multitude also went up with them and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And that is referring to people going with the people of Israel to worship God. And so there are people, Rahab was a foreigner, Naaman was a former. If you remember uh, Rahab uh, in, in Joshua 2, that was the prostitute that hid the Israelite spies um, when they were... Uh, sent to scout out the city before prior to their attack. And Rahab is noted uh, as co and considered righteous for her works for hiding these people. And then there was Naaman, um, who was a commander in the Syrian army, a very high-ranking commander, and uh, but he was also a leper. And uh, Elisha sent a message to the king advising the king of Israel to tell Naaman to come and see him. So he came, he bathed in the Jordan seven times, and he was clean. And so th these are people that were foreigners, but yet they are noted as noble people and, and good people. And so there were people other than the people of Israel who worshipped God. And so uh, verse 4 is referring to these foreigners, among those who know me. Uh, what is interesting about this verse is it also looks forward to, to the time when all foreign nations will bow down to God. And it says, among those who know me, I mention, and then it lists Rahab, Babylon, Philistia, Tyre, Cush, this is a formal introduction to the divine pronouncement, and it uses the idea of the book of the living. You see this is Psalm 69, Exodus 32, Psalm 139. But what's interesting is it mentions here Rahab and Babylon. Now, when it's talking about Rahab in verse 4, it is not talking about what I just mentioned, the prostitute. Uh, the one uh, That's not who it's talking about. Rahab is also another name for Egypt. Uh, for example, Isaiah 37. Egypt's health 
uh, Egypt's help is, is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab, who sits still. So Rahab is also a name for Egypt. Um, and then it mentions Babylon. Egypt and Babylon were two super fi- uh, superpowers who continually fought against I- Israel. Even today, Israel is probably the most hated nation on earth. No different than it was then. Then it mentions Philistia. This is Israel's traditional enemy on the Mediterranean coast west of Judah. And then Tyre. This is an affluent sea power north of Israel. And then Cush. Uh, biblical Cush is the remote region south of Egypt, and it includes parts of modern uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Sudan. And so um, there is not a modern-day Cush, uh, but these areas are, would have been Cush in the biblical times. And these were nations that were uh, usually opposed to Israel. And so here we have in verse 4, those who know me... Um, it looks forward to all of the nations, not just Israel, but all the surrounding nations, even those that hate Israel, bowing before the one true God. Verse 5. And of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. This verse offers metaphorically to a spiritual birth in Zion. In other words, Zion is mother to the spiritual birth of peoples from all over the world. And that includes us. I mean, truly, think about it. Um, When the the promise was given to Abraham that a people would come, a numerous people, and that happened. And then we as Christians have been grafted into the body of Christ. And so we are a part of that same family, uh, even those that were born in Jerusalem, born in her. So Zion, or Jerusalem, if you will, is mother to the spiritual birth of people from all over the world, especially through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, the Lord records as he registers the peoples. You've heard of the Lamb's Book of Life in the book of Revelation. And, um, you know, that we, we could think of that maybe as a literal book. I think it's more metaphorical than anything, but there is a record that God has of those who are his people. And if you're a Christian, if you are in Christ, you are one of those in that book. Verse 7, singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. So all of these different people, including from nations that traditionally have hated Israel, desire to have a connection to Israel, to Jerusalem. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. Uh, What's interesting about springs is the Psalms often mentioned water and springs uh, thirsting as a metaphor to spiritual thirst. So physical thirst stands for spiritual thirst. If you remember Psalm 42, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. And these, this type of thirst can only be satisfied in Jerusalem, God's chosen place. There used to be a song we used to sing a lot. It's a kind of an older worship song that, that said, um, Behold, he comes. And the last line of the chorus says, Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Well, Jerusalem on a hill, out of Jerusalem, out of Zion's hill, comes salvation. Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, dead, rose again. Out of Zion's hill comes salvation. Jesus Christ. That is salvation. And so while this psalm certainly praises the city of Jerusalem, which was God's chosen place of worship uh, for, you know, for, for the people of Israel, but but certainly in Old Testament times for everyone. While this psalm praises Jerusalem, keep in mind that God's salvation holds a universal sense now where not just the people of Israel, but those who were not born in Israel have the opportunity to know Jesus Christ and to worship him. Because of Jesus Christ, we can go directly and boldly to the throne of God and worship him. So I have set this, it's a very short psalm, but um, 
I think a useful, it's a very easy tune to catch on to. And so uh, without any further ado, here is Psalm 87. Thank you for listening today to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Sing, my springs are found in you. 